on here before we begin a serious topic, you know. How does Moses make his coffee? He brews it. <laughs> what kind of man was Boaz before he was married? Ruthless. <laughs> All right. Okay. Puns. You know, maybe they're groaners. I don't know. Anyways. But you know, the interesting thing we want, I want to talk about, and it's not, but it actually is a very serious thing, is that unfortunately it seems like the past is never really past. You know, we have old heresies and we have new revivals of those old ways of thinking. They're just as wrong now as they were back then. I would turn with me to John in the Gospel of John, John chapter 4 and verse 20. Now, I want you to remember that John was writing towards the end of the 90s, uh, somewhere there in the 90s AD. All the other apostles were dead. Jesus had been, who had been crucified and resurrected some 60 years earlier. The temple had been destroyed already. The Romans had come down. When the, when, when the Jews rebelled and they destroyed all things, they destroyed the all, you know, in the Galilee and they just, they, you know, they finally wiped out the last of the Zealots and the Essenes in the Dead Sea region there at Masada in 73 AD. All these things had come to pass. The temple was gone. The Sadducees as a group were destroyed. The Pharisees were none left with picking up the pieces of running the synagogue and in competition with the Church of God, the, the Nazareans, they'd kicked us out. They'd, they called us sectarians and gave us the boot, and we were out. And John was, at this point in time, he was writing, he was in Asia Minor. He was up in this area of Ephesus and Smyrna and all these areas. And as you know, he wrote the book of uh, uh, Revelation from Patmos when the Roman government put him into exile. So a lot had happened. When John wrote this, he's, he's giving us an overview of something of things that Jesus Christ inspired him to put these things down here for our time because the message is relevant to us now. The message is relevant to us now. Because unfortunately the past is never really past when it comes to spiritual conflict and then the challenges that believers face in this world. Let's go to John chapter again. as John, the Gospel of John chapter 4 and verse 20. I'm going to read this in the Phillips translation. This is the woman at Sychar's well. Remember, he comes in, he's, he's sitting there, Jesus was sitting on the well. I've actually been to this well, sitting there on the well, and, and, she, and he asked her for something to drink. And we have this whole conversation that goes on, and he started talking about all of her boyfriends that she'd had. And anyways, he, couldn't, he had all this information, you know, and he wasn't, he wasn't on social media following the Twitter. No, Jesus knew and just as he knows for all of us what our life history is and what we've done. Anyways, John chapter 4 and verse 20. Sir, said the woman again, I can see that you are a prophet. <laughs> I mean, you know all about me, don't you? You know, now our ancestors, so she's changing the subject a little bit. She says, okay, let's not just talk about my problems, you know, and, and all my boyfriends. He said, I mean, let's get to something more important, interesting here. Now, our ancestors, because referring to the Samaritans, see, she was a Samaritan, and the Samaritans claimed to be the descendants of the northern ten tribes who had been removed by the Assyrians some 700 years earlier. And they said, well, they were occupying their place and they were doing God's religion the right way because the Samaritans had their own, you know, scriptures, uh, their own version. They made their own copies. They did things. They had their own customs. Now, now our answers is worshipped on this hillside. She's referring to Mount Gerizim, only a little way from Sychar in, in that well that Jesus was sitting on. And what she's saying, our ancestors, you know, worshipped on this hillside because the old Samaritan Pentateuch, or that is their, 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 their version of the Torah scrolls, the five books of Moses, had inserted the word Gerizim instead of Ebal in Deuteronomy 27.4. So there was, you know, the little sleight of hand the Samaritan leadership had put, been in there to say, okay, this is the appropriate place to worship <laughs> from this standpoint. <laughs> 
And, you know, so that we have, uh, you know, and she's saying, so it's a claim, it's a theological claim. Our ancestors worshipped on this hillside, because this is, you know, the, the proper place to have a temple and all this. We've got the right location. But you Jews say Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship, okay? You, you know, you Jews have this opposing claim, you know? We could go into conspiracy theories of how you got to this instead of the way we do it and all this sort of things. You know, putting it in a modern context, when Jesus answered this here, John chapter 4 and verse 21, Believe me, said Jesus, the time is coming when worshiping the Father will not be a matter of on this hillside or in Jerusalem. Nowadays, you are worshiping with your eyes shut, said Jesus to the woman. We Jews are worshiping with our eyes open, for the salvation of mankind is coming from our race. <laughs> That's a hard thing for... Um, many people who are confirmed anti-Semites to, to understand. Jesus was a Jew. The Hebrews, you know, the Jews were included among the Hebrews. Yes, the time is coming. Yes, and it already has come when true worshipers will worship in spirit and in, I like the way Phillips translates that, reality. Reality. Because the word here, the Greek word, is Strong's 225, it's Aletheia. It is, we'll worship in the, with the truth of idea, reality, it's a sincere, sincerity, truth in the moral sp sphere, divine truth as is revealed to man, straightforward in being that way. The lexicon says properly, truth is, or this word Aletheia is true, something true to fact. And the reason why Phillips chose reality because that in Greek culture, reality was the opposite of illusion. You're talking about fact rather than personal fancy or opinion. When true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth, or aletheia, reality. Indeed, verse 24, John chapter 4, verse 24, indeed the Father looks for people who will worship him like that. God is spirit. And those who worship him can only worship authentically, really, and truly in spirit and in reality. If we're not going to worship God in vain, you know, Jesus made this point very clear in the Gospels. That, you know, when people worship God by using the commandments of men, it's in vain. It's just really of no use. You know, we're going into the time of year. Maybe this is important, you know. Are the customs you follow according to the scriptures? Is that what scriptures actually teaches? <laughs> or is it just human tradition? You might think about that. You might think about that. Let's go to 1 John, now in the general epistles, not the gospel. 1 John chapter 4. I'm going to read here in the beginning. 1 John chapter 4. Because unfortunately, the past is never fully past. <laughs> you know? Old mistakes, old errors, old deceptions keep re getting recycled in our time. Humanity is very slow in learning. <laughs> and what the one generation learns, a succeeding generation seems to forget. I mean, we see that all over the world right now. We're no longer understanding the, the importance of freedom of religion or uh, individual personal rights and freedoms. You know, we overlook the, all of these things. We're, we're, we're sort of putting those over for convenience sake of the leadership right now. Anyways, let's go to First John chapter 4 and verse uh, 1 here. John is making this point. And again, as I said, remember, the Apostle John is making this point. After all the other parts of the New Covenant Scriptures were, had been written, after all the events that had taken place, the tremendous change that had undergone, you know, the Jerusalem was destroyed, the church was scattered. John 4 1 John 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every 
spirit. That is, don't believe, you know, that, that, that every spirit that is speaking through some sort of self-proclaimed prophet or enlightened teacher. Instead, test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets and teachers have gone out into the world. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21, Apostle Paul had this to add. He, he, you know, he, was on, uh, he was on the same wavelength as John, although Paul was writing maybe 30 years earlier. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, Home and Christian Standard Bible, but test all things, or as the margin would say, or test everyone. That is, anyone claiming to be a prophet or a spiritual teacher, test them. Who are these people? What do they do? What is their example? Do they keep God's commandments? Do they follow the traditions of men? What are they doing? What are they saying? Who are they? Test all things or everyone especially those claiming to be a teacher or a prophet. Hold on to what is good, Paul was exhorting the, uh, the Thessalonian church. And again in the Gospels, let's go to Mark chapter 13 and verse 22. Mark 13 and verse 22. Part of the signs that Jesus gave to his people of the end time prophecies. He said, for false Christs, that is false messiahs and false prophets will arise. There'll all be sorts of false religious teachers and they will provide even signs and wonders in order to deceive. It'll be a real medicine show. <laughs> the, you know, the medicine, boom, and a boom, and a kabam, and do, they'll they even do God was inspiring to say signs and wonders in order to deceive. If such thing were possible, even the elect, those God has chosen for himself. See, there's going to be somebody who will say something in the whatever, and there'll be some big whatever it is, a sign and a miracle, and say, oh, see, I am, you know, I am the great prophet. You do what I tell you to do. No. We do what God tells us to do in the scriptures. The scriptures are our authority. It tells us what is right and wrong. Not what all the government says, not what some sort of false prophet has to say. We value everything. We test everything and everyone through the lens of the word of God. That is our authority. We're sola scriptura Christians. If you're a member of the Church of God, that is. I mean, I know there are lots of others, also Rands out there, and they, they follow their traditions, but that's their problem, not mine. Obviously, you know, there have always been false teachers claiming that their teachings are true. Mark chapter 13, verse 22. I'm going to cite this in the Amplified Bible version. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will provide signs and wonders in order to deceive if, if such a thing were even possible, even the elect, those God has chosen for himself. That was a sign that was given that Jesus gave, you know, that we are to watch for at the time of his return. See, it wasn't necessarily, this was not even directed at that point in time to the first century people. This was directed to us here in the 21st century, 20 centuries later. Remember, we're coming up to 2,000 years since Jesus was, was murdered and crucif crucified and resurrected. We have to be, this is, these are serious things.
we uh, Jesus told us that we have to beware of, of false messiahs and false prophets teaching heresy. It is important for us to know them, to recognize them. Now, how do we do that? Let's go back again to 1 John, the general epistle of the Apostle John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. By this you know and recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges and confesses the fact that Jesus has actually come in the flesh, that is, he came as a man. He came fulfilling the Messianic Old Covenant Hebrew Scripture prophecies, that he fulfilled those things. That's such a person, if you confess that and you say that, he is, is from God. God is either the source and that had a big thing. John was making a big point because he was having, there was a lot of heresy that was floating around at that point in time. You had what Gnosticism, but you know, you had this whole movement, both in the Greek world and in the Jewish world, floating around the brethren. That was, the ancient world was filled with this sort of stuff. So John spent a lot of time. This, if we go to the Gospel of John, by acknowledging, he's saying that you know and recognize the Spirit of God because every spirit or spiritual person that acknowledges and confesses the fact that Jesus has actually come in the flesh is from God. He, this is a big theological point because in John 1, 14, in the Gospel of John, he opens this up in this famous statement, the Word became flesh. That is, the eternally existent word took on full humanity. But of course, he was without sin. Jesus never sinned. Hebrews 4.15, it's a doctrinal purpose. I um, mean, point. The word became flesh and took up residence among us, is the way the Holman Christian Standard Bible uh, translates. But you notice, and they point out, when he took up residence when the word became flesh, became the Christ, Jesus Christ, and took up residence among us, it can also be translated, or he dwelt in a tent, or more interestingly, Jesus tabernacled with us, among us. He tabernacled among us. You know, this is a special word in the Greek that's only, only here in John is related, reference to directly to the Feast of Tabernacles, which is very interesting, which is one of the scriptures, one of the biblical uh, feast seasons. You can go to Leviticus 23 to read all about that, or Exodus 40, <laughs> verses 34 to 38. But he tabernacled with us. See, it was his reality of what actually happened. It wasn't, you know, his whole example. He came, he walked. John is writing this, as I said again, some 60 years at this point after Jesus' ministry. And a lot of people, all sorts of stuff was floating around. Was he a real person? Was he a real man? Did he really exist and do these things? Was it all just myth and legend? You know, right now in our society, our leaders have totally turned their backs on the teachings of Jesus Christ. I think it's all, uh, you know, myth, or the, all, all legend or whatever, or embellished, it's just whatever. That's why I, our society is the way it is right now. So the word became flesh, and he tabernacled among us. And we observed his glory, the glory of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 3, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus, <laughs> you know, the one we're teaching, the apostle John was saying, everyone that doesn't confess Jesus, confess here is Strong's word 3670, is homologio, properly to voice the same conclusion, to agree with, to profess, to confess, to be in full agreement, to align with, to endorse. Homologio means to speak the same thing, to assent, to agree with, confess, declare, admit, acknowledging that Jesus is God's promised Messiah, and that his teachings as preserved in the canonical scriptures are authoritative. It's the bottom line, if you want to put it. The, the buck stops with his teachings of the Gospels, the epistles, his word, 
Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not of God, and this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming and now is already here. He's not referring to the Antichrist prophesied in the book of Revelation. He's just talking about those that oppose Christ. Generic, you know, generic bad guys <laughs> from that standpoint. Again, John further made this point in another one of his general epistles in the second John, the second of his general epistles, the scriptures. Second John and verse 7, because there's only one chapter. <laughs> second John, verse 7, Amplified Bible puts it, and John is emphasizing this point, he's saying, for many deceivers, or as the Amplified notes, heretics, posing as Christians. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge and confess. Remember, here's that word again, the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. That he came, he had his ministry, he preached, we have the gospels, he taught the disciples, we have the epistles, we have this information, and that he, you know, he set up the church based on his ministry and what he taught. But, the, you know, these deceivers, these heretics posing as Christians, you know, if, if, they, if they don't acknowledge and confess and they're not in agreement with the teachings of the, that the scriptures have, you know, the, the, that person is a deceiver in Antichrist. You know, he's, he's, in, a, you know, he's, he's in opposition to the teaching of Christ. As believers now, we all want to feel special. We want to be spiritually enlightened. We want to have and live in and be in an, an intimate relationship with our God, especially you know, during these times of stress and difficulty. The biblical narrative as taught in the canonized scriptures is the way to make this happen, to make it a, a reality, to make it the truth in our lives. A lot of people are speaking about my truth. Well, the truth of the scriptures is what make, will make this happen. This is where we find it. It is the scriptures that are our guide. It is the scriptures that are authoritative. But throughout history, throughout history, and right now, there are many groups of sincere, truth-seeking people who have sought confirmation by going to, depending on, searching out extra-biblical sources and teachers who promise you know, them that they have a deep understanding, a deeper connection to God. And they provide esoteric knowledge, the meaning behind this, the deeper meaning, the deeper truths that can't be found in the Gospels, can't be explicitly taught in the epistles. It's been surprising to me to learn that even some people within the greater Church of God movement are now looking into and being influenced by ideas that were once fostered by the writers of what we now refer to as the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are thought to have been produced by the Qumran or Essene community of ancient Jewish sectarians of some 2,000 or 2,100 years ago. Now, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the available options for understanding the identity of the various uh, Dead Street <coughs> Scrolls community that wrote those things was relatively concise and fairly narrow. There was, yes, you saw, the, it was decided, you know, it was more or less that was the received perception of what was going on, the consensus associated the Dead Sea Scrolls with the ascetic Essenes. Now, a few dissenting opinions at that time, 20, 30 years ago, was highlighted, however, the scrolls' commonalities with priestly Sadducees or associated the scrolls with Jerusalem refugees, perhaps, who had fled into the wilderness during the Great Jewish Revolt of 66 to 70 A.D., as I said, in Masada, the last of it was 73 A.D. and was just not far from that. I've been up on Masada. <laughs> it's a terrible place to have to run to. Boy, dry as a bone, hot. A frequent assumption was that the manuscripts somehow represented that these manuscripts were the collected religious literature of a single community, that the Qumran community. And the excavator of Qumran, the archaeological excavator, Roland DeVoe, who's Catholic, Catholic priest, 
um, he interpreted it. He, he, you know, he linked this, the Qumran excavation of this village that was down there with nearby caves where the scrolls were found. And Roland DeVos uh, speculated that uh, the movements, activities in the wilderness probably had begun in the early Hasmonean area, era. Sometime that means around 140 uh, BC, which was, you know, uh, during the time of the Maccabees, and that the Essenes and the community was founded in reaction to the selection of Jonathan Hasmon, the, the brother of Judas Maccabeus, if you would to replace the prior family of corrupt high priests. And that, that was the typical version that received the, of the majority viewpoint of linking the Essenes and who they were and you know their reaction to the Maccabees from this standpoint. But today, however, <laughs> here in 2021, at this point in time, the, pic the picture is increasingly, you know, if you use the academic uh, word, they, they, the picture is complex. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to two, uh, several important factors. First, there's been the full publication of the scrolls, and that's challenged the received wisdom, because they well, how do you count? You know, the questions are how do you count such a broad diversity of of the Dead Sea Scroll literature, as well as the there is, seems these scrolls seem to have a complex editorial and literary history of each individual writing. The underlying historical and social dynamics of the community that shaped the, the Dead Sea Scrolls in all its various editorial forms remains a, quote, complex and ongoing problem, close quote. In other words, boy, you know, it is subject to a lot of debate. Who were these people? University of Michigan academic Gabriel uh, uh, Boccaccini argues that among the proliferation of Jewish sects in the early Hasmonean era, era this is the, all this time immediately you know, before Jesus was born, following the uh, Maccabees and Hanukkah, just, which, which we just finished remarking on, the Essenes, you know, they, she, she argues that the Essenes were, their claim to fame was that they were promoting uh, a, a narrative of Enochic, Origins, I love it. Enoch. In other words, uh, they founded a lot of their worldview based on the Book of Enoch. As such, scholarship regarded the first Enoch as a textual expression of an estranged Jewish community that rejected the competing narrative of Judaism that was promoted by Ezra and the other post-exilic editors who assembled and canonically put together what we now understand as the Hebrew Scriptures. Ezra sometimes gets some hate mail. <laughs> God, however, that's not, you know, that, that's not our view of it. Because we believe in the scriptures. It is the word of God. And we believe that Jesus has had the power to inspire and to preserve what he wants for us to understand and to learn from. But this Enochic Judaism that Botticini says the Essenes were pushing had a, you know, I like it, a unique ideology with a distinctive interpretation of human origins. You know, this, this whole thing with where fallen angels instructed humanity and cohabit with women and create a race of giants, the Nephilim, I guess, and all this. And they, they then I, I love it, the academic, a deterministic understanding. Uh, of the problem of evil, theodicy, and a veneration of Enoch, who was uh, Noah's great grandfather, as the unparalleled vehicle of divine revelation. So this was, you know, a, a better source of information, according to uh, Botticini, the most, uh, the more specialized religious sect at Qumran, represented a radicalized outgrowth of their earlier. Enochic SNE movement and were created by a schism over the authoritarian claims of the, quote, teacher of righteousness, who is a prominent figure in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This concept allows Botticini to distinguish the literary remains of the earlier Enochic parent movement, which included biblical text, portions of Enoch, like the Book of Watchers, Dead Sea Scrolls, like the Temple Scrolls, Jubilee, 
the uh, uh, Qumran 4 uh, cave, uh, the, the Mahase, like a Miksat Mahase Torah, works of the law. Uh, from those, you know, that from those that were later shaped by an emerging schisms, you know, that you had this group of hardliners or who got to be f even more far out than their main, the, that main group of sectarians. And they had their rule of uh, community, the Pesharim. The sectarians of the settlement Qumran, she speculates in the first century BC, before Christ's birth, did not represent the proud headquarters of the larger movement, but rather increasingly alienated and irrelevant offspring. They were just a, a split of a split of a split. The churches of God, we should know something about splits and splits. In the history of religion, you can see it all over the place. Other scholars, however, have criticized the assumptions of Baraccini, <laughs> you know, in the conclusions she arrived at. John Collins of Yale Divinity School, for instance, for example, questions the relationships drawn between the Essenes and the Enochic uh, literature. Collins examines the identity of the Dead Sea Scrolls community through analysis, you know, of, of their major rule books and their literary history instead in his book and Beyond the Qumran Community, published uh, now 11 years ago by Erdman's. Colin argues that two sets of rules do not reflect a schism or different canonical stages within that particular <laughs> uh, single entity, but rather existed, he's saying, there were different groups. They just had side by side within a socially, you know, religious movement, each having its own version of what having a new, new covenant community consisted of because they like to think of themselves as new covenanters. There is, of that group, there is a specialized group in the scrolls talked about as the Yahad, or, you know, the unity people, the rule of the, who had a rule of the community. This group, dedicated to perfect holiness, was not a single congregation, but a collective made up of smaller communal cells that took up multiple pl uh, places of residence. As for the relationship between the Yahad, these cells of, of seekers, truth seekers, to Qumran, Colin suggests the scrolls sh should not be tied too closely to that site. At most, Qumran was one settlement of the Yahad. It was never the Yahad in its entirety. So he, Collins, places the whole, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Teacher of Righteousness within the first half of the f first century during the time of Jesus' ministry and the beginning of the church. And he points out that the, this teacher of, of, of righteousness within that Yahad community, he su suspects that we, he came into conflicts with the wicked priest only uh, lit towards the end of his career. In this view, the original epitaph for the Dead Sea Scrolls community originated within the uh, conflicts within the, with the Pharisees over various interpretations of the Jewish law, not in turmoil with... Jerusalem's priesthood. So there's a whole different perspective of it. You know, there, a lot of these things in the Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, it has been of big interest among Christians, not just among Church of God people, but among all sorts of, you know, and they, it seems, you know, they, again, as I mentioned, that uh, they perceive themselves as a priestly group who are full, pros the Pharisees or the temple establishment. But are there writing something that should impact our understanding of Scripture? What did Jesus and the apostles think of these contemporary, perhaps, Jewish writers and their spiritual message? Today, we may thank this community for they preserved some valuable biblical resources that substantiates the veracity of our modern canon. I remember... When I was in Jerusalem the last time in the 90s, I went to the Museum of the Scroll of the Book, and they have all there, very subdued lighting, the, scroll, the book of Isaiah. Fascinating, you know, to, to look at. They had written the book of Isaiah. But the Dead Sea Scrolls also preserved a witness of the Yahad or the Essenes or the Qumran community, sectarian beliefs, and they believed strongly in extra biblical texts, and they preserved those. They believed and they, they fostered the retellings of biblical texts and commentaries on biblical books. They had their own library of information.
So what were some of their beliefs and what did the writers of the Greek New Covenant scriptures think about the philosophical religious views expressed in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Cuman community? Well, we're going to start to look at some of them. I'm not going to get through by any means all of them because I think we're, you know, I'm already <laughs> somewhere along getting the, in the, in the nature of this message. But let me just go through a couple things and we'll continue later on. But it's important for us to realize and to understand these things because the past, in so many ways, has never really passed. And what was a, an ancient heresy and problem things that were rejected by um, either Ezra or later on by the biblical New Covenant uh, people who put together the, the canon, like the Apostle John, they warned us to be wary of these things. Now, the nature of the Qumran Dead Sea Scroll groups, the Yaha, the Unity groups, whatever you want to call them in their organization, Based on their own writings, it appears they were a philosophical school of thought that composed on local groups. They had cells of people, 12 or more men, you know, each one, and they, they had the, the rules of having three priestly instructors to guide the group. They called their prophet the teacher of righteousness, close unquote, or the beloved teacher who ruled over their yaha, their unity group. The Yahad could only be entered into by a step-by-step -step fashion over a two-year period of initiation. They had specific rules of how you came into the group. Sort of like if you were, uh, <laughs> you know, we, you, you can think of any number of uh, secret societies or whatever. They, you know, you have uh, uh, all these sort of, they, they were very much into that. The Yahad... <laughs> The unity groups view themselves as the sole representative of the divinity. They were God's true representatives. And they believed that uh, Gentiles, non-Jews, had never had a chance of being a full participant by any means because they were Gentiles. They weren't of the right race. So they tended to shun outsiders. And they saw no duty to love those outside their Yahad, their unity group. Sounds quite different from Christianity. <laughs> Doesn't it? Love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, how much of the scripture were devoted from the book of Acts all the way through the writings of the apostle yeah, Paul about, you know, that, that we're all grafted into this root, this common biblical narrative. Very different. Very different. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 46. Matthew 5 and verse 46, Amplified Bible version. Yeah, it's, I find it really rather startling, you know, that they, you know, people outside the group, meh, you know, couldn't give them the time of day. Matthew 5, verse 46. For if you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do that? And if you greet only your brothers, wishing them God's blessings and peace, what more than others are you doing? Do not even the Gentiles, those who don't know the Lord, who didn't grow up with the biblical narrative, do that? You, therefore, will be perfect. That is growing into spiritual maturity, both in mind and character and actively integrating godly values into your daily life and how you behave. You, therefore, will be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So this teaching was very different from the Yahad, from the unity groups, from this Qumran uh, Dead Sea Scroll community, which had, well, our group is one thing, and, and if you're outside our group, you know, hey, <laughs> you're garbage. <laughs> you're impure, whatever it is. I'm sure they had a list of adjectives they liked to apply. Now, these Dead Sea Scroll unity People, these philosophical groups were organized religious, long military lines, it says, with each group led by an instructor or overseer who was of a priestly background. At least they said they were of a priestly background. background. And no insubordination was allowed, and there were severe punishments for disobeying or even questioning the group's leaders. <laughs> this was, they were cults. 
<laughs> they were cults. <laughs> we would that's what we would call them these days. I could think of some of the, the weird cults that we had a number of decades ago. We still have them, by the way. They don't they you know, we don't get the uh, pub, they don't get the publicity these days at all. It's only the COVID cults that get the publicity these days. Anyways, but let's go to Matthew chapter 20 and verse uh, 20. Matthew 20 verse 20. How do you treat people within your group? They have this harsh discipline. It's my way or the highway, you know. <laughs> is, this, is, this, is this the way Jesus was teaching his disciples? Matthew 20, verse 20, amplified. Then Salome, the mother of Zebedee's children, James and John, the Apostle John, so he would have known all, all of this. I mean, after all, he was one of the, uh, you know the story. Anyways, came to Jesus, so Salome came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down in respect, asked a favor of him. And he said to her, what do you wish? And she answered him, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit in positions of honor and authority, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus replied, You do not realize what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup of suffering I am about to drink? They answered, We are able. And he said to them, You will drink my cup of suffering, but to sit on my right or on my left is not mine to give. But it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. And when the other ten heard of this, they were resentful and angry with the two brothers. There are 12 in the group, remember? <laughs> Very interesting. The Yaha, they would have groups of 12. Anyways, but Jesus called them to himself and he said, The rulers of the Gentiles have absolute power and hath lord it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them tyrannizing them, setting harsh rules, judging them, making them do this and that. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your willing and humble slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jew, Gentile, every human being on the face of the earth, paying the price that would set them free from the penalty of sin. See, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And this is the manner that we might have forgiveness, that we might enter into relationship with him. God wasn't being exclusive he was being very, very, very inclusive. And the creator of the world's life was worth more than all of what he had created. So the Yahad communities, the Dead Sea Scroll groups, um, they ate communal meals. And, and if somebody got out of line, they would withhold the pure, the pure food. I guess they had a way of blessing the food to make it pure as opposed to common or impure or unclean. And that was the way that they would punish minor infractions of the Yahad's rules in their ascetic group. If you even fell asleep in a meeting, <laughs> you were penalized for 30 days. Imagine, you know, if somebody fell asleep during my sermon, you know, in the back, you know, I got, he's falling asleep, get him! Yeah. <laughs> You know, and whatever it might be, is that is that the way you could? Was that way we, we run church, <laughs> uh, conduct a service? Well, there'd be a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you know, thirty days, you know, in the pokey, <laughs> whatever it is, and you're, you're, you know, you you can't eat at the table with the rest of us. You go stand in the corner or something, whatever it might be. And they actually had in these yahad groups. Of the Essenine Qumran groups, they would have a yearly review, view of how each member of the Yahad was assessed according to the spiritual excellence. And then they would rank them spiritually among the group. And, okay, you're number one, you get to sit in this place. And you're two, you get to sit here, three and four. And it's a real just pecking order. 
Is that the way you want to run church? <laughs> is that the way you want to have your services? Is it a great idea? I don't think so. How does all this kind of exclusivist group control, this harshness and exclusivist fit with the biblical narrative? Well, I, I don't think I have to go for too long to say, you know, it doesn't. But turn with me to Colossians 2. I want to read. Paul was dealing with this sort of attitude. He was dealing with this sort of attitude. Colossians 2 and verse 18. I'm going to read this in the expanded Bible version. Colossians 2, 18. Paul said this to the Colossians, Colossi brethren. Do not let anyone disqualify you from the kingdom of God, from being part of the new covenant community, by insisting on or delighting in self-denial. That is asceticism, as the expanded says, or false humility, and worship of angels. You know, this was something, we'll get into this a little more later on, the Qumran community and their writings did. Such people enter into or talk endlessly about or pin their hopes on visions which fill them, which puff them up with foolish pride. Oh, we have deeper understanding, spiritual revelations from our teacher. Empty notions because of their human way of thinking. Is this unspiritual or worldly or carnal? It's fleshly. Verse 19, they do not hold tightly. Or, or is, <laughs> maybe that is an understatement. They have no connection with. To the head, that is to Christ. These people don't know Christ. They're not connected with Christ, the Messiah. It is from him that all parts of the body are cared for and supported and held together through its joints and ligaments. So it grows in the ways it wants or he causes it to grow. It's not by your harsh set of ascetic rules and all your discipline and all these sorts of things. That's not how it's done. That's not how we have the unity that comes into the church. Since you died with Christ and were made free from the ruling spirits. See, when we were baptized, we're baptized into Christ's death and then the raised in newness of life just as Christ. That's the whole symbolism of baptism. Since you died with Christ and were made free from the ruling spirits, or uh, you know, some translations, elemental spiritual forces, meaning the demons of the world, from the ruling spirits of the world. See, so you have to keep in mind, remember when, when Christ was tempted by Satan, Satan says, you know, I, I can give you all these seeds. See all the kingdoms of the world? I give it to whoever I want. See, that's what we forget in this society, that there, oftentimes that the powers in this world are not godly. The ruling spirits of this world, you know, are, it's demonic force, it's a demonic influence. Since you died with Christ and made free from the ruling spirits of the world, why do you act as if you still belong to it? To so this, you know, by this world, by getting involved in, and as Paul's writing to the Colossians, you know, the, these groups that have these rules. Rules like don't handle this, don't taste that, don't even touch that thing. See, the Greeks had them as well as the Jews. These rules refer to earthly things that are gone as soon as they are used. They're only human commands and teachings. They seem to be wise. They have an appearance of wisdom with their religious devotion, a forced piety or asceticism, false humidity and harsh treatment, severe discipline of their bodies, but they do not really control or have no value against the evil desires or indulgences of the sinful self, the sinful nature, so the flesh, you know, of what we are as human beings. Paul obviously was familiar with some of these attitudes that the Qumran community, the, the Yahad groups and all this asceticism and all, that they were, he was familiar with this because it has parallel you know, the Gnosticism in the Greek world, too. I mean, I, I, it, you know, they borrowed from each other, I'm sure, enormously. 
Go well, back to Colossians 2. Let's start it. Let's look at the very beginning of this chapter, verse 1, seeing with the expanded. Paul says to the Colossians, says, For all I want you to know how hard I work, how hard I contend, how to struggle for you, uh, for you, those in Laodicea. Okay, this is you know, refers, of course, we know as in the Church of God, you know, Laodicea, Revelation 3, right? This picture of the, the churches. And others who have never seen me. You know, he's, Paul says, you know, I'm writing these this epistle. You know, I'm, I'm struggling to keep, you know, to, you know to, to, to contend to struggle for you. And others who have never seen me or met me personally. I want them to be strengthened, to be encouraged, to be comforted. And join together with unselfish love so that they may be rich in their understanding. So we join, we have our unity and may be rich in our understanding through, un, you know, unselfish love is a key component. This leads to their fully knowing God's secret, his mysterion, which is something that was not as well understood, but is being revealed now in the teachings of the gospel and in the epistles. That is Christ himself, because Christ came as the fulfillment of the prophecy. He came to teach, to reveal, you know, that we might have a relationship with God the Father. He came to set us an example so that we might know how to live. That is why the Gospels were written. The epistles are all about the uh, apostles, Christ's disciples going out and teaching what that meant to people. That's what we live. This leads to knowing fully God's secret, his, his mystery, that is Christ himself. And in him, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are safely kept. It is in Christ, his mission, his ministry, what he came to say. That's, this is where the wisdom and knowledge is. <laughs> I say this, although no one can fool or deceive you by arguments that seem good, but are false. Arguments that are persuasive or enticing, but they're specious. For though I am absent from you in, in my body, my heart, my heart is with you, and I am happy, and I rejoice to see your good lives. You know, the discipline, the, the orderly, you know, that you have in the church, that you're not divided into all sorts of sectarian groups and divisions and things like this, but in your strong, firm, steadfast faith in Christ, who is the head of the church. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so continue to live and to walk in him. See, as we were taught, that is walk in union with him by reflecting his character and the things you do, and what we say, living our lives that lead others away from what the Bible calls sin. We follow, we imitate Christ's example. And Paul goes on, verse 7, Colossians 2, 7. Keep your roots deep in him and have your lives... Okay, let's go to Colossians 2, verse 7. Keep your roots deep in him. As believers, we are to sink our roots into Christ, into Jesus, our Messiah, and have your lives built on him. Be strong in the faith, just as you were taught, and always be thankful. That is abounding, overflowing with gratitude. You know, we, do we appreciate what's been given to us in the scriptures? Is that not satisfying enough? 
Be sure, that is watch, watch out, be careful, that no one leads you away. That is, don't let somebody captivate you. Don't let somebody entice you with false, deceptive, and empty, worthless teaching that is only human. According to human traditions, that comes from the ruling spirits. Again, the, you know, the demonic influence of this world. And not from Christ. All of God lives fully in Christ. That is, the fullness of God is, is in Christ. The fullness. See, we don't need to go elsewhere to look for the fullness of our having a you know covenant relationship with God. Be full of the Spirit. It's, it's the fullness of all of God lives in Christ. <clears throat> and you have a full and true life in Christ, who is the ruler over every ruler and power or authority. You know, the buck literally stops with Jesus. We don't have to go elsewhere. We're not, you know, we're complete in Christ. We're complete in the divine narrative that he's given us in the scriptures. As believers, we all want to feel special, to be spiritually enlightened. We want to have an intimate relationship with our God, especially in these times of stress and difficulty, social isolation, alienation. By living according to the biblical narrative and imitating Christ according to the preserved account of what we have here, imitating Christ as he lived and taught in the canonized scripture, we can have the fullness of God. We can have this new covenant relationship and have our unity with God in this way. He's revealed it to us. He's given it to us. Let us be rooted and established and firm in the divine inheritance that we've been given. Till next time, we'll talk a little more on these subjects.